Hello, this is Dr. Hena Asil. Uh, today we're doing the January 2022 paper 1C for the Edexcel Chemistry IGCS. The first question says this question is about mixtures and compounds. The box gives some methods used to separate mixtures, and he's saying choose methods from the box to answer the following question. So the first question says, identify a method to separate a single food dye from a mixture of food dyes. Of course, if he wants to separate dyes, the process is by chromatography. Identify a method to separate gasoline from crude oil. Remember we said crude oil or petroleum is a mixture of liquids. To separate a mixture of liquids, we use fractional distillation. Identify a method to separate water from copper to sulfate. Now, if we have a solution and we want the water, we use simple distillation. The diagram represents a molecule. Explain why this molecule is a compound. Remember that there is a word called molecule and there is something called compound. Now, a molecule is anything that has more than one atom. So, two or three atoms together is a molecule. Now, if all the atoms are the same, then this is an element. But these atoms are different, so it is a compound. So, this is a compound because it is made up of two different elements that are chemically combined together or bonded together. State the number of different elements. Remember, different elements, he gives me a compound. Now, what these elements are what? Carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen. So, this has four different elements. Determine the number of atoms, then you just add all the atoms. So, you have three carbons plus five hydrogens plus three nitrogens plus nine oxygens. This is a total of 20 atoms. The next question is about rusting, and he says a simplified formula for rust is Fe2O3. Name the two substances needed for iron to rust. Remember, if I have iron and it needs to rust, in order to rust, it will need water and oxygen, both. We said if one of them is not available or it's not there, then the nail will not rust or the iron will not rust. Now, what is the chemical name for rust? Remember, he already gives you that it is Fe2O3. Now, what is the name of that? This is iron 3 oxide. You can say hydrated or you may skip the hydrated part, but you have to say that this is iron 3, not just iron oxide. Then he says, what type of reaction occurs in the rusting of iron? Remember that what happens during rusting of iron? We said you give the iron water and oxygen and it becomes rust. Rust is the hydrated iron oxide, iron 3 oxide. So that means I changed iron to iron 3 oxide and that is oxidation. Some iron objects are coated with a layer of zinc to prevent rusting. Now, when I want to prevent rusting by covering it with a layer of zinc, this type of rust prevention is called galvanization. So if he says what is meant by galvanization, it is covering the iron with a layer of zinc by dipping or spraying. So these pipes, for example, we want to cover them with zinc, we dip them into liquid zinc or we spray them with zinc, that is called galvanization. Now explain how this type of rust prevention continues to protect iron when the layer of zinc is damaged. Remember that the advantage of having galvanization is that even if a piece of the zinc is scraped off or scratched or removed, the iron still does not rust. This is because so long as it is touching the iron, the zinc is more reactive than the iron, so it loses electrons and becomes oxidized instead of the iron, so long as it is touching the iron. Any piece of zinc is touching the iron anywhere, then it is the zinc that will lose electrons and become oxidized instead of the iron. Give two other methods used to prevent iron from rusting. Remember, we had many other methods uh, of uh, preventing iron from rusting. So we said painting, as in iron gates or iron windows, 
uh, coating with oil if we're talking about machines, coating with plastic if we're talking about dish racks, and sacrificial protection. This is where we have a small piece of a more reactive metal like zinc or magnesium attached to the piece of iron. So long as it is touching the iron, it is the zinc or the magnesium that will um, be oxidized and corrode instead of the iron. And then once all of it has been corroded, then it can just be replaced instead of replacing the whole piece of iron like in ships, for example. Question three says the box gives words relating to changes of state. Complete the table by giving the correct word from the box for each change of state. So remember these are the changes of state from solid, liquid, gas, uh, or gas, liquid, solid, or solid to gas. So if he's saying solid to liquid, solid to liquid, you should know is melting. Solid directly to gas, remember that we said some solids when heated, they change directly to gas that is called sublimation liquid to solid what is liquid to solid liquid to solid is freezing then he says when ammonia gas and hydrogen chloride gas mix they react together to form a white solid called ammonium chloride now a teacher soaks a piece of cotton wool in concentrated ammonia solution another piece of cotton wool in concentrated hydrochloric acid the teacher places the two pieces of cotton wool at opposite ends of a glass tube at the same time. After several minutes, a white ring of solid ammonium chloride forms. Notice where is the ammonia, where is the hydrochloric acid, and where is the white ring of ammonium chloride where the two uh, meet. So he's saying state the name given to this spreading out of gas particles. Remember when the gas particles spread randomly from area of high concentration to area of low concentration, that is called diffusion. State how the diagram shows that the particles of ammonia gas are traveling at higher speeds than the particles of hydrogen chloride gas. Now, if you look at the tube, you will notice that the white ring of ammonium chloride is further away from the ammonia solution, nearer to the hydrochloric acid, and that means that the ammonia traveled faster than the hydrochloric acid. So the ammonium chloride forms further away from the ammonia and closer to the hydrogen chloride gas. Then he says gas particles travel at high speed, given reason why the white ring of ammonium chloride takes several minutes to form. Why is it that they don't form? meet immediately well this is because first of all the gas particles are moving randomly so they're not necessarily moving in a certain direction and while they're moving they're colliding with the particles of air in the tube and with the walls of the tube so this takes some time before they meet together and form the ammonium chloride the next question says concentrated ammonia solution and concentrated hydrochloric acid are corrosive Remember, what do we mean by corrosive? Corrosive means that it uh, burns the skin. Give one safety precaution the teacher should take. Remember that when we're working with concentrated acid or concentrated base, we should be wearing gloves because to protect the skin from the corrosive liquids. You can also say that they should be wearing eye goggles to protect the eyes from any splash. Okay. Question four says a teacher uses this apparatus to find the percentage of oxygen in a gaseous mixture of oxygen and argon. This is the teacher's method. Heat the copper powder. So he put the copper powder in that tube in the middle. He heated the copper powder. Push the plunger on syringe A to pass the mixture of oxygen and argon. Remember that. He has in the tubes, in the syringes, a mixture of oxygen and argon, not air. Push the plunger on syringe A to pass the mixture of oxygen and argon over the hot copper so that the mixture moves into syringe B. And then push the plunger on syringe B to pass the mixture of oxygen and argon over the hot copper so that the mixture moves into syringe A. Can you see? He's pressing one syringe and then the next and so on. And he repeats it a number of times. The volume of gas decreases, of course, this is because the copper is reacting with the oxygen in the air. 
Argon is unreactive, so that does not react with the copper, and the copper powder turns black. Give a reason why the copper powder is heated. Of course, if he says in any experiment, why are we heating it? To speed up the reaction or to increase the rate of reaction. State why argon is unreactive. Remember that we said argon ha is in group what? In group 8 or group 0. So it has a full outer shell of electrons. Give the name of the black powder that forms when oxygen reacts with copper. You should realize that when oxygen reacts with copper, it gives copper oxide. This is copper 2 oxide. And you should know that copper 2 oxide is a black solid. The table shows the teacher's results. Then he says, state how the results show that all the oxygen has reacted. Well, you can see from the table that we started with 78 centimeter cubed of gases in the syringe. Now they started to decrease until 58 and then it stopped decreasing. So, so long as the gas is not decreasing anymore or the reading is not decreasing anymore, that means that the reaction has uh, finished and all the oxygen has been used up. So the reading stops decreasing at the end or the reading remains constant. Then he says the volume of gas in the glass tube and connecting tubes is 175 centimeter cubed. You should notice that we have a mixture of the oxygen and argon in the syringes. So it starts in syringe A. Syringe B was, was uh, closed. But syringe A had some mixture of oxygen and argon, but also the tube, the glass tube in which the copper is placed, it had some uh, oxygen and argon and the connecting tube. So he's saying the volume of gas in the glass tube and the connecting tubes is 175. And then there is still the gas in the syringe A. Use this value and the results table to calculate the percentage of oxygen in the mixture of oxygen and argon. So the table shows me that the syringe A at the beginning had 78. By the end of the experiment, it had 58. And that means the amount of oxygen is the difference between them. But then in order to get the total volume of gas that we started with, that you should add the 175 that is in the glass tube and the connecting tubes plus the 78 that was starting, we started with in syringe A. That means that I started with a total of gas mixture of 253. So the percent oxygen is the amount from the gas syringe, which is 78 minus 58, over the total amount of gas in the apparatus times 100, so this comes out to 7.9% oxygen in the mixture of oxygen and argon. So just one reason why the calculated percentage of oxygen in the mixture may not be accurate. Now, if we're doing this kind of experiment, what could have gone wrong or what could be the cause of any uh, error? Um, one main cause is maybe there is a, a leak. Remember these connecting tubes between the syringe and the glass tube and so on. These could have leaks in which uh, the gases will leak out from the apparatus. Or remember that when we're heating any gas and then we want to measure its volume, we have to leave it to cool before I measure the volume because gases expand on heating. So I need to leave it to cool and then measure the volume. So if we don't leave it to cool, then the volume that we record will not be accurate. Question 5 says, complete the table to show the relative mass and relative charge of a proton and a neutron. You should know that for a proton, the mass is 1. It is given a mass of 1. The charge on a proton is a positive charge, so we say the proton has a plus 1 charge. Neutrons also are given a mass of 1. So remember that the mass of the proton is the same as the mass of the neutron, while the mass of the electron is much, much smaller, and sometimes we say it is negligible. Now, what is the charge on the neutron? The charge on the neutron is 0. We say neutrons are neutral.
Then he says, state the meaning of the term isotopes. You should know the definitions that you have in the syllabus. The definitions must be um, memorized, basically, so that you can e express them accurately. So isotopes are atoms of the same element having the same number of protons but different number of neutrons or you could say having the same atomic number but different mass number. but in most cases he says what is meant by isotopes in terms of subatomic particles in terms of subatomic particles means in terms of protons and neutrons and electrons remember that they have the same number of protons they would also have the same number of electrons, but they have different number of neutrons. Uh, the symbol for an atom of one isotope of magnesium is this. Give the number of protons, neutrons, and electrons in one atom of this isotope. Again, how do we determine number of protons, number of neutrons, number of electrons? You should remember that number of protons is the atomic number, which is the smaller number. So the smaller number here is 12, that is the atomic number, that is the number of protons. The number of neutrons is the difference between the mass number and the atomic number, between the big number and the small number, that's the number of neutrons. Now the number of electrons are usually the same as the number of protons if the atom did not lose or gain electrons. So if the atom had a positive charge or a negative charge, then the number of electrons would differ. But here it is a neutral atom, so number of electrons is the same as the number of protons. A sample of magnesium contains these percentages of the three isotopes. Use this information to show the relative atomic mass of magnesium is this. How do we determine the relative atomic mass from the percentages of each isotope? Remember, it is just the mass number of the isotope times its percentage plus the mass number of the other one times its percentage, plus the mass number of the other one times its percentage. All of them add up to 100, so you divide by 100. This comes out to be the correct answer. One mole of magnesium has a mass of this. There are 6.022 times 10 to the 23 atoms in one mole. Remember that this is called the Avogadro's number. Calculate the mass in grams of one atom so if all of these atoms have a mass of 24.32 then one atom would have how much it would have the 24.32 over the total number of atoms so that comes out to this uh, very small number this is 4.039 times 10 to the minus 23 grams the equation for the reaction between magnesium and oxygen is this. Determine the maximum amount in moles of magnesium oxide that can be produced from 0.5 mole of magnesium and 0.2 mole of oxygen. Remember we said, if he gives you information about both reactants, the first thing you need to do is determine which one is excess and which one is limiting. The one that is excess, you're not going to use for any further calculation so we need to know which one is limiting now from the equation you should realize that the number of moles of magnesium should be twice the number of moles of oxygen so if it is more than twice that means it is excess so from the equation if i have 0.2 mole of oxygen i should have or i need 0.4 mole of magnesium now he puts more than 0.4 moles he puts 0.5 that means the magnesium is excess and that means when I want to determine how much magnesium oxide, I'm going to relate it to the number of moles of oxygen, not magnesium. I'm going to ignore the information he gives me about magnesium. 0.2 mole of oxygen will give from the equation, the number of moles of the MgO is twice, so it will give 0.4 mole of magnesium oxide. The diagram shows the electronic configuration of atoms of sodium and oxygen. Describe the changes in the electronic configuration of the atoms of sodium and oxygen to form the ions in sodium oxide. So this, is, this needs to make sodium oxide. Now, what happens in order to form sodium oxide? You should realize that each oxygen needs two electrons in order to have a full outer shell because it has six. But each sodium has only one in its outer 
most shell so we need two sodium atoms each of them will lose one electron so they will become Na plus and the configuration electronic configuration will be two eight because I have lost the outermost electron now the oxygen atom will gain two electrons from these two sodium atoms this will form O2 minus and that means my oxygen will become electronic configuration 28. Calculate the relative formula mass of sodium oxide. How do we calculate relative formula mass? Well, we look at the periodic table and we add up the masses. Again, remember the mass is the bigger number. So the MR of sodium oxide will be sodium is 23. So I have two of them. That's 23 times 2. Plus oxygen is 16, so the total is 62. Remember, to get MR, you use the bigger number or the mass number. Explain why solid sodium oxide does not conduct electricity. You should know that sodium oxide is a compound between sodium and oxygen, metal and non-metal, so it's ionic. Ionic compounds do not conduct electricity when solid, because the positive and negative ions are not free to move since they are in a rigid crystal lattice. Remember that the structure of any ionic compound is a crystal lattice with alternating positive and negative ions. As solids, this is a rigid structure. This, the ions are not free to move. When we heat it and it become, becomes molten or when it is dissolved in solutions, then the ions will be free to move. Give a test to show that sodium oxide contains sodium ions. What is the test for sodium ions that we have? Flame test. Remember, flame test for sodium, it will give a yellow flame. When sodium oxide is heated, it reacts to form sodium metal and sodium peroxide. Now complete the equation. So the sodium oxide, when we heat it, it gives sodium plus the sodium peroxide, which already gives me the formula for. Please do not make mistakes, especially if he already gives you the information in the equation. But remember that you have to balance. There is no equation in chemistry that is not balanced. Whether he tells you to balance it or not, it has to be balanced. So this would be the balance. This question is about soluble and insoluble compounds. A precipitate is an insoluble compound formed when solutions of soluble compounds react after mixing. So he has three tubes and he's telling me in which tubes will a precipitate form. You should have a background of what substances are soluble and what substances are not soluble. Uh, we said before which ones are soluble. Sodium, potassium, ammonium salts uh, are all soluble. Uh, all acids are soluble. Um, things like copper sulfate, you should know is soluble. Calcium chloride is soluble. Any nitrate is soluble. All nitrate ions are soluble. So let us take a look at these tubes. Tube 1 has copper sulfate plus calcium chloride. Well, what would that give me? That would give calcium sulfate plus copper chloride. Remember, when we have 2 and 2, the exchange. So copper sulfate with calcium chloride, the exchange. Copper Instead of copper sulfate, it's copper chloride. And instead of calcium chloride, it's calcium sulfate. Now, which of these can be? Uh, a precipitate you should know that calcium sulfate most sulfates most sulfates are insoluble and form precipitates except things like copper sulfate you should know that copper sulfate is a solution um, any sodium or ammonium or potassium of course would be uh, soluble so calcium sulfate is insoluble so tube a will have a precipitate now, tube 2 says magnesium nitrate plus potassium sulfate. Well, if I have magnesium nitrate plus potassium sulfate, magnesium sulfate is actually a soluble substance. And we said any nitrates are soluble. So all of these are soluble. There will be no precipitate in tube 2. Tube 3 says sodium carbonate plus copper sulfate. You should know that copper carbonate is a green solid. We work with it a lot. So that will form a precipitate so you're going to end up with a precipitate in tubes one and three 
Then he says a student mixes solutions containing equal amounts in moles of silver nitrate and sodium chloride. State the color of the precipitate of silver chloride. Remember, uh, we have a test for chloride in which we add acidified silver nitrate and the chloride, you should know, will give a white precipitate. That is, remember we said chloride, bromide, iodide. Chloride is white, bromide is cream, and Iodide is yellow. The student wants to obtain pure dry crystals of sodium nitrate. Crystals of sodium nitrate decompose at high temperatures. Describe a method the student could use to obtain pure dry crystals of sodium nitrate. Remember that he gives me this equation where he did silver nitrate plus sodium chloride and he got a white precipitate of silver chloride and he wants the sodium nitrate as crystals. So that means that now I have a mixture of the precipitate of silver chloride with the sodium nitrate solution. So the first thing I need to do is filter through filter paper and funnel. This will get rid of the silver chloride solid and I can get the filtrate. The filtrate I heat to point of crystallization, cool to form crystals, filter the crystals, wash with a few drops of distilled water and dry between filter papers. Give an advantage of mixing solutions containing equal amounts in moles of silver nitrate and sodium chloride. Remember that the equation says the number of moles should be equal of silver nitrate and sodium chloride. So if I put equal amounts, that is to make sure that the silver nitrate reacts with the sodium chloride and it should give me a highest yield of product. Also, one of the reasons would be I wouldn't have any excess of my reactants, so I don't have it with my uh, required products. The table shows the structures of six organic compounds. Give the letter of a compound that is not shown as displayed formula. Remember, displayed formula is where you have all the bonds showing. So if you look at A, a has that CH3 at the bottom, that is not displayed. Displayed means I have all the carbons with all the bonds going to all the hydrogen, so all the others are displayed formula except for A. Then he says, from these choices, give the letter of a saturated compound. So saturated means what? Saturated means it has no C double bond. No C double bond C. Because the, the one that has C double bond C, it, we say, is unsaturated. So saturated means I have only single bonds, but he wants it with the general formula CnH2n. You should know that the CnH2n is actually the general formula for alkenes, which are unsaturated. But you should also know that the CnH2n is also the general formula for a cyclic compound. So if you look at C, you will find that the number of hydrogens is twice the number of carbons. At the same time, there is no double bond, so it is a saturated compound. Name compound E. Remember, how do we name any organic compound? We look at the number of carbons. It has three carbons. Three carbons are prop. It has a double bond. That means it's an alkene, so that is propene. Explain why compound A and D are isomers. Where is A and D? A and D have both of them the same number of carbons, same number of hydrogens, but they have different structures. That is the definition of isomers. They have the same molecular formula. That means same number of carbons, same number of hydrogens, but different structures. Then he says from these choices, complete the equation for the reaction. Compound F reacts with bromine. So if I have F that is methane, I react it with bromine. Remember that alkanes, when they react with bromine, they need ultraviolet radiation. And what happens is uh, we remove one of the hydrogens and we replace it with one bromine. And my other product would be the hydrogen that I remove plus, plus the other bromine. And this kind of reaction is called substitution reaction. Another compound has this percentage composition. Show by calculation that the empirical formula is this. 
how do we calculate empirical formula? Again, we put the percentages, or sometimes he gives it to me in grams. So whether it's in grams or in percentages, it's exactly the same procedure. The first thing we do is divide by the molecular or mass number of each one. So divide by 12 when it's carbon, by 1 when it's hydrogen, by 35.5 because it's chlorine, and I get certain numbers. So the first thing we do is divide by the mass number of each atom. Then the numbers that come out, I divide by the smallest. So which of these is the smallest? I divide all through by 1.57. That comes out to be whole numbers. So all of these numbers are 2.0, 4.0, 1.0. .0. So these are the whole numbers. Remember, if it doesn't come out to be 2.0, if it comes out to be 1.5 or 1.4 or 1.6, you need to multiply through by a certain number in order to turn it into a whole number. You do not round up the numbers. So here we show that the empirical formula is what he wants. But then he says the relative formula mass is 127. So what is the molecular form? Remember that empirical formula shows the simplest ratio. The molecular formula will show the actual ratios. How do I get that? The compound that I got as an empirical formula, I get its MR. So what is the molecular mass of the C2H4Cl? It is 63.5. But then he's telling me it shouldn't be 63.5. It should be 127. So I divide the 127 by the 63.5. That is twice what I have. And that means that the molecular formula is actually twice the empirical Okay, then he says compound E is used to make an addition polymer. Complete the equation to show part of the polymer formed from two molecules of E. Now, first of all, how do we write a polymer, the, the structure of a polymer? We look at, this is of course, this is addition polymerization. And we said, why is it addition polymerization? Because the monomer we're starting with is an alkene or it has a double bond. So if I want to draw the polymer, how do I draw it? I look at the two carbons that have the double bond. I copy them as a single bond. And a bond after and the bond before to show that they will be joined to other molecules like themselves from the two carbons that have the double bond. And then I look at the original compound. That first carbon was bonded to what? It was bonded to H and H. And the second carbon, the other carbon on the other end of the double bond, it's bonded to a hydrogen and bonded to a carbon that has three hydrogens. So this is how I draw it. But then he doesn't want it once. He wants it twice. He says, I'm going to have two of these. So you just copy that twice. Remember that what we're drawing is just a repeat unit. It's a very small part of the long chain which we call polymer so i can repeat it twice if he wants two molecules or i can repeat it three times or i can just write it once if he's not uh, saying that we should repeat them so this is the uh, part of the polymer that is made from two molecules of it. then give one problem caused by the disposal of Polymers. Remember that we said, what is the problem with polymers or what is the disadvantage of polymers? They are non-biodegradable. They cannot be broken down by bacteria. So they accumulate in dump sites. That's one problem. If he wants another one, then we say when we burn it or when burnt, they release toxic gases. A student uses this apparatus to investigate the rate of reaction between calcium carbonate chips and dilute hydrochloric acid. Every 20 seconds, the student records the reading on the balance. So remember that we put a carbonate with acid. What happens? It gives out carbon dioxide gas. The carbon dioxide gas escapes. So the mass in the balance, the reading on the balance will decrease. So explain, first of all, why are we using a cotton wool plug and why does this increase the accuracy of the student's result? Remember, 
I cannot close the mouth of the flask with a bung because I need the carbon dioxide gas to escape. But at the same time, I do not leave it open. I put a cotton wool in it. Why? We said this prevents loss of solution by splashing. So that the decrease in mass that I am seeing is due only to the gas escaping, not because some of the so solution has splashed out. Complete the equation for the reaction by adding the state symbols. You should know, he says, calcium carbonate is in chips. That means it is a solid. Any acid is always aqueous. Water is always liquid. And carbon dioxide, of course, is a gas. The student uses the balance readings to find the decrease in mass. And the graph shows the student's results. And he's saying, give a reason why there are some calcium carbonate chips remaining in the flask when the reaction stops. So he says, at the end, I still have some calcium carbonate chips in that flask. That means that all the acid has reacted. And that means the calcium carbonate was excess or the acid was the limiting reagent. State how the student would know when the reaction has stopped. How do we know? The reaction has stopped if no more bubbles of gas are given off or if the mass stops decreasing or the mass remains constant. Use the graph to determine the amount in moles of carbon dioxide produced. Now let us look at the graph. The graph is showing the decrease in mass. Remember that if it went, it decreased 0.98, that is the amount of gas that was given off but he wants he doesn't want it in grams he wants it in moles so that means i'm supposed to get number of moles number of moles is the mass over the molecular mass which he already gives me so that means that he had 0.022 mole use the graph to calculate the rate of reaction remember how do we calculate the rate of reaction you need to draw a tangent at that point so he wants it at 60 seconds you draw a tangent to the graph you you know this is math you should know how to draw a tangent to the uh, graph at that point at 60 seconds and then you measure the change in the y-axis over the change in the x-axis so 0.9 minus uh, it went down to 0.56 divided by 60 seconds that comes out to be 0.006. The student repeats the investigation by diluting the original hydrochloric acid. The student then determines the initial rate of reaction at different percentage concentrations. So he changed the concentrations every time and determined the rate. Describe the relationship between the initial rate of reaction and the percentage concentration of the uh, hydrochloric acid. Remember, from the graph, you can see that from the graph, as we increase the percentage, the rate increases. And you have to mention that since it is a straight line, then there is a direct proportionality or it is directly proportional. Explain why changing the concentration of hydrochloric acid has an effect. Well, what happens when we increase the concentration in a reaction? Increasing concentration causes more particles in the same volume, so we have more frequent collisions or more collisions per minute. Draw a dot and cross diagram to show the outer shell electrons in a molecule of nitrogen. Remember that we look at the periodic table. Nitrogen is in group 5. It has 5 electrons in its outer shell, so it needs 3 more. So each nitrogen is going to donate three of its electrons to be shared with the next one. And it still has the rest of its five. So don't forget to put the uh, rest of the five away from the area where we're sharing between the two nitrogen. Describe the forces of attraction in a covalent bond. Remember what is meant by a covalent bond. It is the strong attraction forces between the bonding pair of electrons and the positive nuclei of the atoms. Do not say just one nucleus. It is actually the two nuclei of the atoms that are sharing the electrons. The diagram shows three different structures of carbon. And he has structure A, name structure A. You should be familiar with structure A. You should realize that structure A is diamond. 
And then he says graphite and C60 fullerene contain covalent bonds but have different structures. Explain why C60 fullerene has a much lower melting point than graphite. Remember that C60 fullerene is something that has 60 carbon atoms. This is actually a small, simple molecular structure. And whenever he says that anything has a low melting point, this is most probably because it has weak attraction forces between molecules. So the fullerene has a simple molecular structure with weak attraction forces between molecules that need a small amount of energy to be broken while graphite has strong covalent bonds in a giant three-dimensional structure. Remember that covalent bonds are strong and they need a lot of energy to be broken. A student uses this apparatus to heat crystals of hydrated zinc sulfate and collect the liquid produced. Describe a chemical test to show that the colorless liquid contains water. What is the uh, chemical test for water? Add anhydrous copper sulfate, it turns from white to blue. Describe a physical test to show the colorless liquid is pure water. What is the physical test for water? Heat to boiling, it should boil at 100 degrees Celsius. Then he says the equation for decomposition of the hydrated zinc sulfate is this. So basically, he is heating the zinc sulfate hydrated to form the anhydrous, the one without water, plus the water alone. So he has the mass of the tube alone and then the mass of the tube plus the hydrated zinc sulfate that he put into it. And he says calculate the maximum volume of pure water that could be produced. Okay, so from this information I can get the mass of hydrated zinc sulfate. It's the difference between the two numbers that he gives me. Then we can get the number of moles of the hydrated zinc sulfate, that is the mass over the molecular mass which he already gives me, and this gives me the number of moles. Looking at the equation, the number of moles of the water is seven times the number of moles of the hydrated zinc sulfate, so that gives me the number of moles of water. That means I can get the mass of water, mass is number of moles times mR, Remember that if I get the mass in grams, he already tells me you should know that the density of water is 1, so the mass is the same as the volume, so that gives 5.6 centimeter cube. And then he says, <clears throat> in an experiment using a different mass of zinc sulfate 7 water, the maximum volume of water that could be produced is 8.5 centimeter cube. So he said, I can, the maximum I can get is 8.5, but the students collected the pure water and calculated the yield to be 20.3%. So instead of getting 8.5, the students actually got only 20.3% of that. So the volume of the water that he collected is 1.7 centimeter cube. Explain an improvement to the apparatus that would increase the percentage yield of pure water. This is the apparatus he used. Is this how we usually collect a liquid we should use a condenser instead of the delivery tube or he can put the measuring cylinder in ice that would make sure that the vapor that comes out is condensed into the measuring cylinder okay this is the end of the paper thank you for listening and i hope it was useful to you